Welcome to Connected Rheumatology. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz. For those of you new, thank you so much for stopping by. I am a board certified internist and rheumatologist based out of Dallas, Texas. I have 10 plus years practicing rheumatology and currently see patients in my practice, Connected Rheumatology. And here on YouTube, I talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness because it is all connected. If that sounds like something you'd like to hear more about, make sure you hit that subscribe button and share this video and this channel with anyone else you think might benefit from this information. So today I'm going to talk about chronic pain and fibromyalgia. You know, everyone's story is unique and I see so many patients with different stories of how they end up in my office. But the one thing that seems universal is that over the course of their journey, most people have come across friends or family members or unfortunately even healthcare providers who either gently suggest or sometimes just outright accuse those with chronic pain of it being all in their head. And if this has happened to you, I know that this is a very sensitive subject because it is actually very common. And I have seen this statement crush people. So today, I'm going to invite all of us to try to reframe that idea. What does it even mean that it's all in, all in our head, all in my head, whatever? What does that even mean? Could it be true? So stick around, let me explain. So chronic pain can last days to weeks to years, and it can be in any part of the body. It can be described as stabbing, throbbing, burning, sharp, dull, people with fibromyalgia, but also people with arthritis, in the back, in the knees, in the hips, can suffer from chronic pain. It can be precipitated by something like an injury or an accident, or it can just pop up and seem random. Someone with a diagnosis of fibromyalgia might have some sort of trigger, might undergo some sort of stimulus and feel pain 10 out of 10, whereas someone without that condition who is exposed to the same stimulus hardly notices. But what is it exactly and what causes it? Well, the research at this point has been heavily directed at looking at our nervous system. So what I thought I'd talk about today are three ways our nervous system is involved in our chronic pain. Now, first off, let me just preface this by saying some of these concepts get a little technical. I mean, everything about the nervous system and the brain and, and nerves can just get a little technical. So I'm going to do my best to break this down and make it as digestible and understandable as possible because I think that when we understand what is going on with us, we are then put in a much better decision to, or much better position to figure out what's gonna help us and what's gonna work for us. Um, so the first concept we're gonna talk about is central sensitization. And it is exactly as it says, central referring to the central nervous system, which involves our brain and our spinal cord, and sensitization, which is just that it's sensitive. Our nervous system is complex, and we have nerves that tell us about the outside world. And for example, in our hands, we can touch things, and when we touch things, our, we send signals from our hand up into our spinal cord, where we then, the nerve then talks to another nerve that then goes up to the brain and tells the brain what's going on. But the brain also sends nerves down. So it's bi-directional going both ways. So when we're talking about pain, there are a set of nerves, a set of pathways that nerves follow that come from the brain down and their job is to inhibit, to stop a pain signal. Now, why in the world would we want that to happen? Well, when we're experiencing very, very severe pain, then that signal can overwhelm the brain and we have an innate ability to kind of shut that off. So for example, when someone's in a very bad car accident and really, um, really severely injures their arm, for example, 
then the pain coming from that injury would overwhelm the brain. So we have this great way of protecting ourselves and this pathway from the brain down kind of stops that pain signal from getting to the brain so that we don't get overwhelmed, which is why you oftentimes hear when patients or when people have these horrible accidents, they will report feeling numb or they'll report that they didn't feel any pain at all until later in the hospital. So what we know is that in fibromyalgia, this inhibition, this stopping of the pain signal is broken. And that pain signal doesn't get halted the way it would in a healthy nervous system. So how do we know this? Well, I bring this up for my own nerdy reason. I actually think the science is really interesting and still evolving. So what I say in today's video in one, two, or even five years down the road may end up being, I'm not gonna say wrong, but incomplete. So nerves speak to each other through chemicals and those chemicals are called neurotransmitters. And you might have heard of serotonin and norepinephrine when talking about depression and anxiety. And these are just chemicals that nerves use in order to talk to each other. And they are used, serotonin and norepinephrine specifically, are used by those nerves coming down from the brain to stop that pain signal. Well, when we test the fluid that is that surrounds our brain and our spinal cord, where we should find a healthy amount of serotonin and norepinephrine, we find in those patients with fibromyalgia that their levels of those neurotransmitters are lower than they should be. And so that's just a piece of evidence that points to this theory possibly being true. Now the second phenomenon that happens in the nervous system is called the wind-up phenomenon. So this is focused on those nerves that are taking the pain signal up to the brain. When our nerves are exposed to some sort of painful stimulus, a first response is sent up to the brain. If those nerves are then re-exposed to the same stimulus, in a fibromyalgia patient, the response that's sent up to the brain, that is sent up to the brain, is exaggerated. And is actually more than even that initial response. And this is called the wind-up phenomenon. Now, a little bit of this is actually very normal, but what we have found is that in fibromyalgia patients, this phenomenon is exaggerated. So not only do they have this exaggerated pain response going up to the brain, but our ability or the fibromyalgia patient's ability to halt that, that message has been decreased. So you're just getting a lot of stimulus up to the brain saying pain, pain, pain. Now we can actually see the changes in the brains of patients with fibromyalgia using MRI, specifically using functional MRI. These are MRI machines that are able to see what parts of the brain are being activated at, during certain activities or under certain circumstances. And what they find is that patients with fibromyalgia will have different areas of the brain light up with much higher intensity when they're exposed to different painful stimuli compared to patients who don't have fibromyalgia. So I'm gonna show an image here, um, just an example. This was taken from a study published about 10 years ago, so it's not new information, but it's showing two scans, one patient with fibromyalgia and one patient who doesn't. They were exposed to the same, what's considered a non-painful stimulus, which was basically a certain amount of pressure put placed on the thumb. And then they look at how their brains respond. And the patients with fibromyalgia had lots of different areas light up compared to the patients who don't. So there is something going on in the nervous system, both in our nerves that travel up and down our spinal cord to tell us about pain or inhibit pain, but also in our brain. And I think all of this is really important to understand, especially when we start talking about medication. So the third point I wanna bring up is that so many, in fact, the majority of the medications that we use, both that are FDA approved and that are used off label, are really focused on the nervous system. And this is the reason why, because the research so far is really 
highlighted how the nervous system is involved. Medications such as duloxetine and minalsepram are medications that alter the neurotransmitters serotonin and norepinephrine within our system. Same with gabapentin and pregabalin. They alter the amount of neurotransmitters. Now, these medicines are far from perfect. As I've said in other videos before, in fact, I have a video dedicated to what you can expect to hear from your doctor when you go in to talk about treatment for fibromyalgia. But I think it's important to understand the research and the knowledge behind what we think is going on because oftentimes I have seen patients given a prescription and they can see on the box or they see on the internet that these are medicines that are very similar to medications utilized for depression and anxiety and this can further that idea that we are telling patients it is quote unquote all in their head, which is not the case. Now I'm not gonna speak for every doctor that gives out these prescriptions and every situation is different, but I do want to say that these medications have other actions in the nervous system that have nothing to do with depression and anxiety that have been shown to be helpful for chronic pain. Now, of course, I am always gonna advocate for significant lifestyle changes changes in diet that cut out sugar and processed food, having a good sleep hygiene practice where you're getting good sleep every night, having a intentional stress management practice, having good relationships and moving your body every day have all been shown to decrease pain and improve quality of life. But I think it's important to understand where the science is and how that leads to the recommendations that you're getting from your doctor because it's only with that information can you then make the best decision for you as far as what's going to help and what your what you what the next best step on this journey is for you. If someone you know and love is struggling with chronic pain, is not getting the answers that they need or want, not getting anywhere with the providers, please share this video and I hope it's just a little bit of information to try to explain the science behind what we know from chronic pain. It is so much more complicated than just what I discussed today. We didn't even touch hormones or genetics or the immune system and how they can all play a part, which, spoiler alert, they all do. But it's a starting point and I hope that it inspires you to keep doing your own research, write down your questions, take them to your doctor and start the conversation about these topics and about which treatment options are gonna be best for you. As a reminder, there are references in the description box below with some of the scientific journals that I use to help me put this together. Thanks so much for watching, thanks for subscribing. I would really appreciate it if you like this video to give it a thumbs up. Make sure you've subscribed. If you haven't, what are you waiting for? We talk about all great stuff here about rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, mental health and wellness because it is all connected. Thanks so much and we'll see you next time.